Welcome to Herd Online. Hope you're doing really well today. And we are going to look at an article that examines dim light or uh, more bright light and how that supposedly affects our cardiovascular health. And I must say, I am a little bit sad today. Uh, last Herd Online, uh, I, I enjoyed that because it was like there was some insanity there. Uh, it was really odd. Uh, but th th today, Ah, it's sometimes you wonder like what are we doing like what are we doing aren't we supposed to be kind to each other to help each other to reassure each other you know and i know this can come across as a little bit judgy and whatnot but sometimes you just wonder and i hope it will be clear to you why i say this as we look at this article from phyllis z and colleagues um so today's episode was actually suggested by uh jennifer uh, she said in an email to me and asked if I could share this and she said fine, but I didn't ask if I could share the actual email So I'm just reading it to you. Uh, she said good afternoon This article was a topic of discussion on social media today Perhaps down the road it could be part of your heard online segment personally I have to sleep with a little bit of, of light in the room a pitch black room triggers a migraine uh, was what Jennifer said and I said of course uh, thank you for the suggestion and um, let us take a look at what it was that Jennifer had came across. What was this article that was discussed on social media? Well, it was this. Uh, Jennifer heard it on um, NPR, and there's a headline uh, that says, sleeping with even a little bit of light isn't good for your health. Study shows, as we've seen before on Heard Online, very dramatic, very alarming, very triggering topic, right? Suggesting that even just a little bit of light isn't good for your health, is what NPR says here. And I'm not going to read this. I'm just going to say that um, they refer to a study by Phyllis Z and colleagues at, at Northwestern um, in Chicago. And so let's hop over and, and look to see what was this study that made, um, that made uh, the NPR so concerned here that they, had, that they felt the need to share this. You know, well, what, what, where, where, what, what's, what's this concerning study? So let's take a look at it. Uh, it was actually published in PNAS, which is a very reputable, like a uh, high impact journal, right? And the, uh, the title uh, within the journal is Light Exposure During Sleep Impairs Cardiometabolic Function. I would say it's basically just as triggering as the NPR uh, article, right? It just says that if you're exposed to light when you're sleeping, well, this imp impairs your cardiometabolic function. That doesn't sound good at all, right? Very triggering, very alarming. Uh, as we've seen in previous episodes, again, like these, are, you know, you'd think scientific journals were more concerned about like, you know, uh, you know, how should I put it, put forward a, a very, something very objective, something that aligns with the results of the study. Uh, but the, the, they work the same way as tabloids, like they, they, they want scary and alarming headlines. So anyway, um, so we, we look at the abstract here and we can see that, um, the hypothesis here, I think it's very interesting to read, is the following. Um, where was it? Pardon me. Um, I think it was towards the end here. Uh, okay, here it is. Sorry about that. Uh, the authors say, in the present study, we tested the hypothesis that room light exposure, 100 lux, during habitual nighttime sleep, is associated with increased insulin resistance as measured by the homeostatic model of insulin resistance, the Matsuda insulin sensitivity index, and impaired response to oral glucose tolerance tests the next morning. And so the authors are basically saying, like right off the bat, that what we intended to show, our hypothesis, what we thought would happen, that we, what we wanted to show here was that if, you, if you're exposed to light uh, during sleep, then your insulin resistance will be uh, increased and uh, you will have an impaired uh, uh, response to oral, glu uh, oral glucose, an oral glucose tolerance test. That's what they set out to prove. And, and it's very interesting to see that, you know, that, that was the intent behind the whole study to kind of prove their hypothesis, right? And uh, are we going to be surprised when we find that they find some evidence for this? Of course not. That was the whole point, right? Anyways. Let's, let's, let's take a look at the results. And this is classic. This is classic. You know, pretty much every single time I've reviewed an article similar to this, it's the same story. 
is the small little study that took place over the course of two days, three days, something like that. And here we go again. Participants, a total of 20 healthy adults were randomized into the room light condition. So uh, 10 of them uh, were, you know, slept one night in a dim light room uh, with less than three lux, followed by one night in a bright light room with 100 lux. Okay, so that was one condition. 10 people went into that condition. And... Um, and then you had a dim light condition. So 10 people slept two consecutive nights in dim light. So those are the two conditions. So 10 people, one night uh, dim light, one night bright light of sleep, and 10 people uh, dim light, dim light. That, that was the whole randomization. Again, 10 people in each group. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 10 people in each group. That's all. That's all, folks. Two nights. Two nights of, of condition. That's all. That's all there was. Right? They say that there were, there were no, these two groups were not significantly for age, body mass index, sex, race. And they did some actigraphy saying that like generally their sleep was similar. Their efforts were measuring like how sleepy people perceived to be. They say were similar. There was no, no difference there. Now, um, let, let's go. Um, let's jump right into the results here. They say that, and this is like, I'm not an expert in these things, but I think some things are very interesting and clear. They say that this... Um, Index of insulin sensitivity was different from day one to two. Uh, however, when, when you start looking at the, some details there, something becomes really interesting. They say that the glucose and insulin profiles, uh, you know, th there was some difference there. But then when you look at the actual, you know, figures, you know, you start becoming much less impressed. So what we're looking at here is the room light condition and the dim light condition. Okay, so in red we have the room light condition, and in, in black we have the dim light condition. And I think red was purple to show some because when we are like, you know, warning, warning, red light, right? It's, it's, it's again more alarming if something is red. We'll see, we'll be more of that in a second. But anyway, so here they're tracking um, the, the, the minutes after a glucose bolus. So, you know, we drink a lot of sugar, right? And we see what happens to our glucose. And it goes up and then it starts going down again, right? And the solid line here is day, day one. So in this condition, it was after at least 10 people had slept in dim light. And the, uh, the, the not, what's it called, not dotted line, but the da with the dashes here, that's uh, the, the, the second day after the, they had slept in, in, in bright light. And like the difference is like, what is it? Like 140 nanograms per deciliter versus 150 nanograms per, per deciliter for uh, you know, 30 minutes or something like that of the of glucose. And then if you look at insulin, it's like, you know, 40 pick, pick or whatever this is. I don't know if you know how to pronounce it, but there's some difference. But the difference is only significant at 20 minutes and 30 minutes after, after drinking the glucose, which is like that really caught my eye. And they're saying that in the, in the dim light condition, there was no difference at all between like the two nights. But then when you start like digging into this, you see like what I believe is what mostly is looked at with this uh, two hour glucose tolerance test is the area under the curve. And the reason is that we're not interested in a, the spot level of insulin or the spot level of glucose at any given uh, time period. We're, we're looking at kind of the big picture. What was the overall, overall response in the body, right? And they're saying here that the change in two hour area under the curve of glucose and insulin from day one to day two did not differ between conditions. They did not differ. There was actually no difference when you looked at this kind of this, this wider and more commonly used uh, measure, measurement type. And then they say, however, however, the change in 30 minutes area under the curve of insulin um, from day two, day one to two, was significantly higher for the room light condition for the dim light condition. So to my, you know, again, you see this like they're looking for something and 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 they find something somewhere that they can highlight. So the global measure was actually so, so to me, the news here or what they found was that there was no difference. There was no difference when you look at the the standard measure, the two hour area under the curve, but they choose to to really highlight. The 30 minute mark, because that's where it's sort of different. So they have a 30 minute mark. And they 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 they, uh, they highlight this that the early phase insulin under the curve was different. And here you see the red, like this is red. The, the 30 minute thing was red, but overall there was no difference. 
The Matsuda insulin sensitivity, I don't really understand that, but I think we've already made kind of the biggest points clear. And what else did they look at? Well, they looked at sleep macrostructure, which is basically like sleep stages, right? And they saw that the total sleep time was similar. There was no difference there. There was no difference um, it, when it came to sleep fragmentation. That I think that's very, very important to highlight. Sleep fragmentation is basically how often we wake up, how often we have arousal. There was no difference. There was no difference in sleep fragmentation when, whether these people slept in a dim light room or a, a bright room. There was no difference. There was also no difference in the average number of wake episodes during the sleep period. So if you wake up and you're awake for a long period of time, that's called sleep after uh, wake after sleep onset. There was no difference. And uh, sleep-wake stage stability, whatever that means, there was no difference. The only difference they saw that was, was in the first condition uh, there was a little bit, the percentage of stage two sleep was higher and the percentage of slow wave sleep was lower. What does that mean? You, you know, you tell me, I, I don't think that means anything. Um, you know, certainly has nothing to do with cardiovascular health, okay? And then they say um, here, there was no association between the change in sleep master, microstructure. Okay, nothing of interest there. Microstructure, I don't actually know what that is, but there was no difference in that. I think that's when you look at, you know, even granular, more granular levels of EEG activity. How about subjective sleepiness? No difference. There was no difference also in the, in the plasma melatonin, which was very interesting. You'd think that light has to do with melatonin, but actually they saw that there was no difference in that. There was also no difference in the area under the curve of melatonin levels, right? Very interesting. If anything, I think that could be something that could be, you know, the highlight of this study, something they actually found that melatonin was not affected by light. That's interesting, very interesting to me. Now they look at heart rate variability and they're, they're making this point uh, of the, the, um, the change in, in heart rate was, was more significant in the room light condition than the other one. Again, we have the red light here. But when you look at the numbers, you see that the average heart rate was uh, like you know around 58 maybe the first night. And then the second night, it was like 62, maybe something like that. Like, does that even mean anything? And couldn't just the fact that people knew that something was different from night one to two, maybe made some people a little nervous and they had a higher heart rate. It sounds like they did not make any changes from day one to day two in the um, dim light group. It wasn't like they said, okay, now we're going to change something. This is the second night. So now we're going to change something. They didn't do that in the dim light condition. So there was no real randomization in that uh, in that regard. So I don't know what that means. I don't think that means anything whatsoever. Um, and so I think there are a few more things uh, that were that also very, there was no difference in, oh, here we go. Uh, they said there was no, there was no association between the change in heart rate and these like insulin uh, numbers. So uh, they make some they postulate earlier in the article that perhaps insulin resistance is driven by a, you know, higher uh, sympathetic activities. Uh, you know, we're stressed, our sympathetic nerve system is more active. Maybe that leads to impaired glucose tolerance, they, they say somewhere, but they can't even show that there was an association between these two things. Also worth noticing, right? Then we look at daytime blood pressure and heart rate. There was no difference in heart rate and systolic or diastolic blood pressure across the wake period from day one to two. And I'm sure they, they you know, uh, I'm sure they looked, uh, we, can, we can almost tell from this that they looked for that. They looked at systolic pressure, they looked at diastolic, diastolic pressure, they looked over, you know, during the whole period, they didn't find anything. They were sure, surely they, were, they, would, they would be very excited if they found something and they didn't find anything. There was no difference in the change from day one to two in hunger, how hungry people felt, no difference. And, and then they say, this study provides insight into the physiological mechanisms underlying the relationship between uh, nighttime and light exposure during sleep with cardiometabolic function. I mean, when I read this, uh, this article, I think there's absolutely nothing we can say about cardiovascular health here. Absolutely nothing. It took 10 people into this, 10 people into that, and you didn't find anything that mean, means anything in terms of like, these people's health. And, and this is where I become sad. I become really sad because like, what are we trying to do? Are we, are we just trying to like scare people and, 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 and get eyeballs and attention and, 
and uh, you know get you know funding and grants and like you know sell advertising on like uh, you know on the media outlets that report this. What are we really trying to do? Uh, so anyway, I, I want to thank though big big thanks to Jennifer and <laughs> you know no medical advice here, but from I am reading here. I don't think there's any problem whatsoever with having some light on, even a hundred lux, you know, lighting in the room. To me, there's no evidence whatsoever that's harmful in any way. So we'll conclude there. Look forward to hearing your thoughts on this. And uh, I can tell you that next, next chart online, that's going to be fun. It's going to be fun because that article is, is, it's out there. It's way out there. But anyway, we'll conclude here. Thanks so much always for, for tuning in and uh, 